This is lecture number 13 for AP Biology, dealing with communication. So we're going to deal with methods of communication, just because communication turns out to blur the line between behaviors and interactions. And there's a whole bunch of learning objectives and text references for this. So communication itself is a form of behavior, namely because bits and pieces of communication turn out to be innate, meaning if you were certain forms of communication, you just naturally will do, or you don't get much to say because it turns out to be your coloration. And other forms of communication turn out to be learned because using language, or at least our particular version of a language, is something that's learned. So communication most assuredly is a behavior. So some of these ways that we communicate turn out to be purely visual, such as the peacock showing off its tail, which is there for reproductive purposes, meaning to say, hey, look, I'm symmetrical, so I have good genes. I grew this thing out, so I'm healthy, and I'm not dead yet carting this thing around. So I'm pretty good. But you could also use it for intimidation, such as mimicry with these two moths. Or you could say, pet me. So visual communication works a whole bunch of ways. But that's not the only way that we can communicate. We can also communicate using sound. Dolphins are well known for their intelligence and communicative skills. Each dolphin has a unique signature whistle, which helps individuals locate each other. Unlike humans, dolphins lack vocal cords, but they do use a complicated system of whistles, squeaks, moans, trills, and clicks produced by muscles within the blowhole. And they can even use their calls to hunt out prey on the sea floor. Using echolocation, or sonar, dolphins send out frequencies by clicking. The clicking sounds have a range of around 600 feet. The sound waves bounce off objects, and the returning signals reveal the location of the prey. So, needless to say, if you picked up on it, they said that each dolphin turns out to have a unique, unique set of sounds associated with it, which is a nice way of saying they have names, which is pretty cool. But there are other versions of communication, some of which aren't necessarily as learned, but they turn out to be more fixed action pattern. So those are coyotes, and if you start a howl, they'll start howling back because they're communicating with each other, but it's an automatic response. They hear it. They have to respond. It's a fixed action pattern. Then you have another form of communication, which we call humoral, or what I'm calling humoral communication for now. And I'm calling it that simply because I don't want to say it's chemical communication, but basically we're going to talk in terms of things we can't see. So substances inside of liquid and soil and gas that we don't know that's there, but clearly something is there. So we could have two plants that are connected through some another plant, or another, not another plant, but through a fungus called mycorrhizae, which just means the fungus forming a root or a root forming fungus. And what these things turn out to be is a mutualistic relationship between a plant and a fungus. And what you can have is the two plants communicating with each other. One of them's under attack, the other one becomes aware of it. And by aware, I mean it elicits a response. It doesn't mean that there's a brain saying, oh, something's occurring, let's think this through. It's personification. But the plants 
respond, even though one is attacked and the other one isn't yet. But the one that isn't under attack reacts. We also know that this occurs through the air, so we don't need to have mycorrhizae, but if we examine the soil, we notice that something is different about the soil. So the plants talk to each other. They are communicating, and they're doing so using some weird substance in the air and in the soil. Animals do this a lot, typically with scents, and that's usually a way of nice way of saying, hey, do I eat you? Do I not eat you? Are you in charge? Are you not in charge? Do I know you? Do you belong here? And if you sit there and say, oh, well, humans don't do that, well, of course we do. It's called perfume and cologne. We're absolutely doing this all the time. It's kind of cheating because I'm talking about cells and I shouldn't be talking about cells yet. But there are other ways that this turns out to manifest and it's mildly useful, especially if you've ever had a cavity. And that is inside of your mouth, you have lots of organisms in there because you happen to have an abot or you have an ecosystem within your mouth. And certain signals will actually tell the things living inside your mouth it's time to clump together. There's something in the chemistry, there's something in the liquid that tells them to clump together and what they end up forming is something called a biofilm. And biofilms are the things that need to show up in order for you to get cavities because they kind of form like a cocoon and change the environment such that the bacteria can now start burrowing through your teeth. So this humoral communication, this this non-visible communication stuff turns out to be a big deal, especially if you've ever had cavities. So all of this allows for interactions, all those forms of communication, because it's either identifying prey versus predator, or it's saying, hey, let's help each other, or we're related to each other. All of that results in interactions, and those interactions help build the community, which is the basis to allow ecosystems to function. What we're noticing as humans as we go more and more digital is we're having more issues with communication because how do humans communicate? We communicate off of how we look. It's why we always gesture with our hands. It's why our faces are always shifting when we're talking. And it's also our vocal expression. So does your voice go up? Is it going down? You know, is it being sarcastic? You can't tell that with words. You can only tell, truly tell, by looking at someone and texting does not help my generation the millennials well i'm barely not a millennial but i practically behave like one we're guilty of this and so is your generation because what we're noticing is people can't communicate well i'm when I, like when i email i'm very cold and just here's what it is and i've been told oh you're very harsh and it's like no no i'm not being harsh at all but it's because miscommunication exists whenever we're not meeting face to face. So just keep that in mind when you communicate. I try and keep it in mind too, even though evidently I fail.